I think it's certainly true that if we try and create artificial intelligence that is more intelligent than humans, uh, and we don't know how to control it, that's going to create the potential for all sorts of risks uh, now and in the future. So, you know, I think there's lots of different scenarios to worry about, but I certainly think it's right that it should be very high on policymakers' agendas. Is that the tipping point? Is that the moment of worry then? The moment that computers become cleverer than us, they may decide that it's in their best interest to get rid of us, to put it in, I, I suppose, fairly simple terms. Yeah, I mean, look, I think there's lots of different types of risks with AI. And often in the industry, we talk about near-term and long-term risks. And, you know, the near-term risks are actually pretty scary. You know, you can use AI today to uh, give you recipes for bioweapons or mm. to launch large-scale cyber attacks. And, you know, these are bad things. The kind of existential risk that, that I think the letter writers were talking about is, is exactly as you say. They're talking about what happens once... Uh, we effectively create a new species, you know, a sort of an intelligence yeah. that's greater than humans. And is that inevitable in that computers are learning at this exponential rate or are we able to stop them from becoming clever enough forever? It's certainly not inevitable. I mean, we, we, we don't know that we're able to do it. However, you know, the reason that people are starting to get worried and the reason that, you know, even the people making... Uh, making these uh, systems, the people that signed the letter, mm -hmm. is that the rate of progress that we've seen over the last two or three years has been pretty striking. And so I think one way to think about this is imagine the January 2020 moment in COVID. You know, it's sort of very tempting to say, oh, you know, the number of cases isn't going up that much. And that's because we're, you know, we're not used to thinking about these exponentials. Yeah. I think what the signers of that letter are saying is we're on an exponential. Like these systems are getting more and more capable mm -hmm. at an ever increasing rate. And if we don't start to think about now how to regulate and how to think about safety, then in two years' time, we'll be finding that we have systems that are very powerful indeed. Is that the sort of time frame we're looking at, sort of one, two years' time, three years' time, when computers do achieve, if not regulated and properly kept in check, that moment of surpassing us in intelligence? The truth is no one knows. Um, there are a very broad range of predictions among AI experts. I think two years would be at the very most sort of bullish end of the spectrum. There are others who think... The closest moment. Yeah, the, the closest moment. There are others, you know, very credible people like Jan LeCun, the chief AI scientist at Facebook, who says... We have no idea how to get there, and it could be many decades. All right. In, in summary, it's not going to happen tomorrow, but we've got about two years or so to get this right. We've got two years to, to I think, get in place a framework that makes you know, both controlling and regulating these very large models um, much more uh, sort of possible than it is today. OK. I think uh, Elon Musk was addressing precisely this the other day as well, and he said the, the risk of an existential threat, humanity being wiped out by AI, by computers becoming incredibly clever and... and turning on us is not zero, wouldn't say where it was. Would you be so kind as to give us a percentage? I think it's not zero. Um, I mean, I think that the, the, the risk of the framing of the existential risk is that it sort of sounds so sci-fi today yeah. to a lot of people. I'm sure a lot of people watching this will think... Well, it's literally the plot of Terminator. Right, it, sa it, sounds like, it sounds like the plot of a, of a movie. Mm. But one, I, I don't think it is. I think, I think like the rising capabilities is very striking. But also, you know, if we go back to things like the bioweapons or the cyber, you can have really very dangerous uh, threats to humans that mm. could kill many humans, not all humans, simply from you know, where we'd expect models to be in two years' time. And I think that's really the thing to focus on now, is how do we make sure that we know how to control these models? Because right now, we don't. And how do we have some... Uh, sort of path to, to regulating them on a global scale, because mm. it's not enough to regulate them, I think, nationally. Uh, now, some others also say, why are you worrying about computers? You just need to pull the plug out. Is that realistic or not? Well, I can tell you what the argument is from people who think that uh, that's, that's not enough. What people worry about is that, uh, you know, a, a machine might start to think about, you know, an algorithm, you know, running at very large scale. Mm. Well, in order to, you know, make that improvement, I need to make sure that I'm not switched off. Because mm. if I am, I will fail to achieve my goal. So how do I do that? Well, I'm going to you know, protect myself in some way against those things. So that's, that's the argument. You know, people talk about these what they call instrumental goals. They're not the thing we asked it to do, but the thing that the machine decides is important to helping it do that. All right, let's go on to talk about regulation. I guess you could see America, the EU, the UK perhaps agreeing a code of conduct. Anthony Blinken, the UN Secretary of State, has already started that. But how do you sign up China or Russia, especially when our interests in what we want AI to do may be very, very different indeed? I think it's a very difficult problem. I mean, I think what I would say is that everyone benefits from AI being safe. Um, I'm glad I don't have the challenge of how you do that negotiation. Well, the Chinese or the Russians might benefit from AI not being safe. 
Well, I think certainly if, if you think about like what is what is one of the obvious benefits of AI if it goes right, if you know if we get end up with very powerful systems that are safe and robust, mm. it is that it improves everyday life for mm. everyone. You know, you can imagine you know AI curing diseases, making the economy uh, more productive, um, helping us get to you know a, a carbon neutral economy. I, I think that's going to be one of the ways that governments all over the world want to deploy AI. It's very hard to imagine that the Chinese government yeah. wouldn't want to do that. And so we will have a shared global interest. In these systems being safe and robust, and uh, I think that's where you know I think that's what the the hope sure. has to hang on. Uh, quite a few people have argued that transparency is the answer. If we know precisely what sort of code is going into AI, what AI is doing, how AI is powering things, then we know how to unpower it and how to stop it. Would you be a big advocate for transparency and how AI works? I think there are two different challenges there. Uh, one is that. Um, even when all the code is open, we'll call it open source, when you know, even if you and I could just literally go and download the model from the internet and yeah. you know, deploy it ourselves, that doesn't actually give us um, the sort of transparency that you might expect. Because um, when we run these models, when we train them and then we, when we run them, um, we don't actually understand fully what they're doing. We don't understand how they get the outputs that they get from the inputs, even when we have complete visibility mm. of, of the code. So I think it's really important not to conflate you know, kind of openness and accessibility with understanding. In fact, it's a very active area of research right now. How do we actually understand what they're doing? So I, I wouldn't want anyone to think that transparency is a panacea. Look, being transparent on AI code to, to the likes of me is completely <laughs> pointless. Being transparent on AI code to the likes of you or someone who might run a regulator in the future knows a lot about this, that's really useful, isn't well, it? Well, I think what we definitely will want to have, and as far as I understand it, you know, all the leaders of the, the major organizations building AI are saying something along these lines, is mm. we do need to be able to audit and evaluate these models before yeah. they're deployed. You know, right now, these are not dangerous systems, I would say. You know, chat GPT is not dangerous. Yeah. But they did do six months of safety work on that before they deployed it. I think it's going to be very important in the future that anyone with a powerful model that they want to deploy has yeah. to have it audited and evaluated. A kite mark, if you like. Yeah, I think that's one way of thinking about it. OK, I guess the problem with regulation, and also nice worry, your task was trying to get the best out of AI for Britain after all, is there's a danger, isn't there, of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Same with all regulation. If you regulate, it makes people feel safe. If you overregulate, suddenly we're less competitive. China, the EU, whoever it is, is going to overtake us, and they could become dominant, not us. Well, I think we need to draw a distinction between two very different types of AI systems. We have what I would call narrow AI, which is where you're solving a very specific single problem, and then general AI, which is the type we've been talking about, where you're trying to build, I mean, so it's not a great metaphor, but you're trying to build a brain. And I actually do worry that there's a risk, not in the UK, but you know, elsewhere, certainly in the EU, that we over-regulate narrow AI. I want it to be that you can go to the hospital and yes, have a human radiologist, but with an AI co-pilot mm. who is really good at detecting cancers that the radiologist might mm. miss. I think it would be a real disaster to regulate that into oblivion and make that, that those benefits not possible. I think the general AI systems that we're talking about, though, um, it really is about balancing the, the, the risks and the opportunities. I mean, I think AGI, general AI done right, will be the best thing, the yeah. best technological breakthrough the species, our species has ever made. But I do think, you know, Every country in the world has an interest in that being safe. And I think yeah. that's the distinction I would draw. Let's really let innovators in narrow AI go to the races, but be quite cautious about the general AI. OK, final question, because we've talked about quite a lot here. What's the one thing about AI that keeps you awake at night at most? The fact that the people who are building the most capable systems uh, freely admit that they don't understand uh, exactly how they exhibit the behaviours that they do. They were signatories to this letter. Absolutely. That is quite terrifying. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Matt Clifford, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.